<laughs> do we need to be this close? Oh, I've got no choice, oh. really. I can maybe do this. No, go a bit closer. <laughs> oh. So what are we saying? <laughs> well, I mean, imagine if we do want to come up at ages. No. I suppose on a more serious note, we are here today to talk about... <laughs> what? Are oh, you supposed to be serious? <laughs> I don't do very well with serious actually. You don't do? No. So uh, where to start really? There's been a lot going on um, and I think yeah we kind of decided it would be good to share this journey. I think Beth came up with the idea more than me really. I think it would be it's really important to sort of be you know vulnerable and transparent um, especially with you guys and it would be a great idea to take you on this journey with us uh, mm -hmm. because it's I'll be honest, I'll probably touch on this a little bit later, but it wasn't something that I ever thought that I would find myself doing. So I think it is important to, you know, share what it's actually like day to day um, going through this journey. So hopefully any of you guys who are going through anything similar, you can relate to it. Hopefully it helps, um, you know, that you're not alone. Yeah, that's, 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 that's my contribution. <laughs> yeah, so we're currently, um, I'd say about uh, eight months into this process um, to be honest it's took eight months to pluck up the courage to start recording this video because it's been so intense so overwhelming um, just all of the emotions like good and bad I guess um, I don't know why I'm getting emotional already. I know, I know, I know. I know. It's been like, I think... This now is that, why now, I now, now you're actually like This is why I didn't it. want to record it, because I knew I'd get upset. I know, I know. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot built up and... I mean... Oh. I don't. Sorry. Don't be sorry for it. Sorry. I know it is. It's emotional. There's a lot of like... You know, a lot of stuff built up, isn't it? And I think once you've now yeah. you're, now you're actually voicing it, it's confronting. I know. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, this is definitely why I didn't want to share it because it's been like incredibly overwhelming and emotional and um, like just so out of my control. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm a super open person. Um, I want to share as much as I can to help all of you, especially since sharing my endometriosis journey. I know it's helped so many of you. So it feels like only right to share this, but it's not easy. And that's why it's like took to get to this point for me to even pick up the camera. And I've asked Connor to do it with us because he is a big part of this process, but just to hold me accountable because I don't know if I ever would have picked up the camera if I didn't mention this to Connor. But I kind of just want to bring you up to speed as to like what we've been through so far, where we're at, what we've got coming up and just be super honest. So if you are also going through this or potentially might be going through this um, in the future, it'll hopefully give you a realistic insight into what it's really like. Um, everybody's different. Everybody copes with things differently. Everyone has completely different anatomies so there's no two people who will ever go through the same experience but you know, hopefully this will just give you a little bit of uh, reassurance that there is there is hope even when you think that there isn't and we're only really just getting started so i guess we'll start from the beginning as you know i had my surgery last july it's literally just been my anniversary for my one year surgery and that was when was that tuesday this week and um, so we're currently july the 21st 21st today. today i went into my surgery i think we both went into my surgery hoping that that would be the thing that was stopping mm. us from getting pregnant because connor and i got together in march 8th 2020, 2020 just before lockdown and i was using natural cycles the whole time i think we'd been together maybe about a year Mm -hmm. And we started to just be a little bit more... Not as careful. Not as careful, because when you were wanted a baby, when you were... I was, at this point, like, 31, and 
you know, we want to have a family. We always knew that. I was a bit more forthcoming than Connor, mm-hmm. wasn't I? You were. Connor was a bit like, ooh. I don't know. <laughs> uh-huh. So I was scared. You were scared, but I had a feeling like I knew it was going to take a while. So I kind of thought, let's just get this ball rolling. But I respected Connor, so I waited until he was ready. And then we just kind of just loosened off on the tracking and we just kind of moved forward and just lived our life. It kind of got to around middle to the back end of 2021. Yeah, while we're in Manchester. Yeah. Yeah. So it was we'd been together about a year, year and a half, mm-hmm. and we started to think, right, let's be a little bit more conscious of our ovulation window. Mm-hmm. And at the back end of 2021, the start of 2022, is when my health really started to deteriorate. My endometriosis just stepped it up about 100 times more than it ever had. I was just a couple of months from being diagnosed with autoimmune hypothyroidism, which is Hashimoto's disease. And I was incredibly depressed, incredibly fatigued, incredibly unwell, and just incredibly not in a good place. Connor wasn't in a great place either. We were in Manchester, we didn't have support. It was just a really lonely, horrible time. So really on reflection, trying to have a baby in that moment probably wasn't the best idea, no. really, when I think about it. In, pl- in like in terms of our nervous system, just we weren't in a good calm place. But yeah. you know, like I'm being honest here, we'll have to be honest. That's what we decided to do. And I knew the following year I was going to be bridesmaid. As the year ended, 2021, and the the new year begun, I realised that I was going to have my laparoscopy, my endometriosis surgery that year. So we were quite cautious, weren't we? Because we had to be quite specific with when we tried because Mm -hmm. I had an MRI in February and then I had my operation in July so take into account those months the couple of months before we kind of didn't because Mm -hmm. we knew we couldn't so on off how long would you say we've been trying for I'd say nearly two years Mm. between one and a half and two years I'd say um it's been like more of a conscious thing so I had my surgery, my surgeon was great, he was adamant, I was all good, even though my ovary had to be like peeled off my wall or mm-hmm. whatever it yeah, was. Yeah. Everything on the left hand side was super fused together, which wasn't ideal, but he was like super confident, my fallopian tubes were all good. And he expected us to be pregnant within the first few months. So um, when he rung me a couple of months later and was like, are you pregnant? Mm-hmm. And I know a lot of people would be like, that's terrible, but... My surgeon, he was so lovely. Yeah. He didn't have any ill intent yeah, in that it was, way. It, was not, it wasn't malicious. It, it was wasn't. Like, it's more of like an excitement. He was just excited and he, he was just a lovely, really dedicated to his specialism. And he was just, he just wanted to kind of give us what we wanted. Um, so sadly, I said, no, we're not. But at this point, I had already spoke to the gynecological lead at my GP surgery. And that was around September. And I expressed my concern. I kind of explained I had stage 4 endometriosis, where it was affecting me and, you know, how there was almost a little bit of a matter of urgency. She referred us with no question to the fertility clinic in Newcastle. But before they do that, they like to do uh, the day 21 progesterone test and they take your blood on day 21 of your cycle and they kind of look to see if you're ovulating. I think they look at at my AMH levels and which is your ovarian reserve. I think, don't quote me, and some other other factors in your blood. Mine was fine, as far as I was told anyway. And then we got our first letter in correspondence from the fertility clinic in Newcastle. And that was in October and it was to invite Connor in for mm-hmm. a semen analysis. Yeah, just to basically sort of think, okay, well, everything is working correctly with Beth. Obviously going with the expectations, oh, I should be okay as a man. Well, just society is usually the it's women that are looked at, okay, well, what's wrong with them? And then obviously the man is overlooked. So the thought came into my mind, oh, well, yeah, what? If, okay, what if this is me then? So I, I never really had any um, reason to believe that until obviously I went in for the test. So I did my semen analysis test and then the test results came back and my test results were borderline. So hearing that word, it makes you think, well, what the hell does that mean? So is it good? Is it bad? So after speaking to one of the staff about my results, they couldn't really say, well, yeah, it's not good or bad. It's borderline, hence the name. So a lot of the results, um, they test you on your concentration, the motility, so how, how the sperm moves. Um, they also test you on the morphology, the shape of the sperm. And they also test you on motility, morphology, concentration. And that was it, wasn't it? 
No, <laughs> it's full. Hang on, I've got the results here. Volume, concentration. So yeah, the, so the volume, concentration, the motility, and the morphology. So I was good on three of the results. One of them was under. Um, was one of the, I thought one of the others was a bit sketchy too. So one of the results was under and the other one was borderline. So hearing that sort of made me think, oh crap, like, is this, is it because of me? Or is this why we've not been able to, you know, conceive? So having the conversations of like, okay, well, what can we, what can be done about this? And luckily, there is a lot of things that can be done to improve to improve the results. Totally. Like yeah, your, your 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 sperm sample and your sperm quality. Um, so it had to be a few lifestyle adjustments made. So things like cutting out uh, protein supplements, things like that, which for me was like a big adjustment because it's something that I've done my whole life essentially so that was a bit of an adjustment and a shock really uh, and a shock yeah you don't think of protein well yeah shakes. you don't you don't really like um you don't necessarily think that that can be a contributing factor but going through this process you it makes you realize that there's so many different things um that can affect it you know the phrase you are what you eat is actually so true yeah it's more true than you can ever imagine mm -hmm. because the thing with protein shakes is they're great, but they're also unregulated. <laughs> so like mm. there's essentially things in there that's probably um, not beneficial for male fertility. Well, clearly, mm. which they don't mention. And yeah. con with Connor always having trained for his maybe 10 years, maybe Longer, 20, yeah. maybe 15. Yeah. This has been something that's been heavily integrated into his diet for years and years and years, 10 plus years. I will say, and I want to be 100% transparent, this whole process is going to test your relationship to the absolute max because in that moment when that fertility nurse said to me you need to really ask your partner to stop having protein shakes and because they're unregulated this will impact his fertility um, his sperm i literally was like i told you i told you connor and because i had mentioned that because for me i'm way more holistic than connor is connor trains to you know to look a certain way and yes to be healthy but for me my lifestyle and with having endometriosis i have cut out a lot of stuff in my life and have a more holistic view on things so for me having maybe an overconsumption of dairy in your diet is of course inflammatory so i was on his case before the nurse said that and it caused a bit of conflict didn't it mm -hmm. and when the nurse said mm. <laughs> i told you so mm. all of this i did i will be honest i did yeah and but guess what the next result so yeah so um you have to test with sperm you can only test every three months um and that that's the life cycle of sperm so any changes that you make will will only take effect within three months time yeah. so retested um in so february. so in february february the 15th and you have to abstain for like four days four days so yeah. it wasn't really a very romantic valentine's day no it wasn't unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> retested and the samples came back and everything improved which is which is great so the samples were normal there was you know, I'm, I'm fertile essentially with the results so making those changes obviously made it made a big difference in between this it's worth mentioning that i had my first appointment in january so connor had his first semen analysis in november we had nothing until january which was a joint appointment mm -hmm. followed by an appointment for myself on the same day and then you had your repeat in february so in the january appointment we went in, we spent two hours with a fertility nurse. We went through all of our history, um, all of our medical history, if we've ever had any successful pregnancies in the past, which neither of us have, neither of us have been pregnant before. All of these things help build a picture for the fertility experts to kind of look and understand where does this couple stand? Um, and she said, it's looking like it's more than likely gonna be unexplained infertility. So in we went, I wish we had have recorded this, oh, no. but we didn't know that this was going to happen and they did an ultrasound scan of me. So they put the probe inside, they had a look at both my ovaries, they said that everything looked fine and the, you know, my surgery worked well because there was no like anything questionable there and they had good access to both my ovaries, which was great. I then had some bloods took and everything was good. That was a long appointment. I feel like we were in that place for two for about two really hours and i think as well at that point because i got like i had my day 21 progesterone all good from the doctors and then i had my scan 
which was fine and I was all good, because you hadn't had your second analysis at this point, all roads were like leading to you, weren't mm -hmm. there? And you were, I think you maybe were thinking, it's me, it's my fault. Mm -hmm. And I've said this before to a friend who's gone through very similar, it's not a blame game. It's, it's not, it's your fault or it's your fault. It just is. Like, it's so easy to get into a mindset of, well, it's you, well, it's you, well, it's you. And we didn't, we didn't mm -hmm. do that. But I think... You can see why people do. Subconsciously, I think maybe you, there is an element of, well, who is it? Mm. Like, is it me or is it him or is it her or is it me? You know, like, and I think that's probably where your head was going when we had been in that appointment in January, at the start of this year, and I was fine. Mm -hmm. And you still had to wait for your results, which then, like mentioned, had come back absolutely normal. Mm -hmm. So we're basically, we're both fine. So we thought, well, what next? Mm -hmm. At the same time as Connor getting his results, I reached out to an acupuncturist who is a fertility expert in Newcastle and I had been told that having acupuncture was super beneficial to help endometriosis, help any of your um, kind of flare-ups and stuff like that, but also help with fertility. So we had a consultation. She prescribed um, some Chinese herbs, which I have to admit I never took because I was just a little bit scared to take something I am on thyroxine, it's a medication for my thyroid and I don't want to knock that, so that's why I was a bit sceptical with that. But I did go ahead and I had about eight sessions of acupuncture with her. We're not pregnant, so who knows if it helped or it didn't help. Yeah. You know, one of the girls that me and my friend know who recommended this lady got pregnant after three sessions of acupuncture. Yeah. So it works for some people, it doesn't work for others. Yeah, I, I've basically been willing to try absolutely anything. Mm -hmm. The amount of lifestyle changes I've made, you know, I think the biggest thing is the stress. This whole process, even up to now, has been highly stress inducing. Yeah. There's been other things that have been going on outside of this, work, but also family life. There's been a lot of things for us and for myself in particular to really navigate and figure out it's an added layer if you can try and protect yourself from that when you're trying to have a baby do but it's so hard because life happens around you and people have different expectations of you and when you're going through this it's all you can focus on so in march we had our appointment with uh it was a no, fertility no. nurse yeah it was a fertility nurse and she basically come on the call and was like great news so both of you are fine we're gonna say it's unexplained infertility so we can offer you ivf I was like, whoa, 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 hold on a minute, yeah. hold on a minute, hold on a minute. I was like, I don't, how did you feel in that moment? Um, Honestly. A bit like, I'd say I probably felt a little bit like it wasn't real because it's, it's such a big thing. And then to be like said so casually like that, I was like, whoa, wait, what? Like, so so this this is this is what it is. Do, do, do you know what I mean? It's just it's, it's, it's one of those where you like, you don't. You kind of don't want to accept it in terms of like that you don't want to accept that that is reality but then like when it's said and brought to you like that like so nonchalantly it's like oh shit well is, is this what's happening now yeah. that's the kind of feeling that you get yeah so i think obviously it impacted beth more than me because it's a different journey for me and beth she is the one ultimately who has to go through the procedure obviously i will be there every single step of the way to support her but I can only do so much, can't I, in mm -hmm, this situation? Mm -hmm. So, like, I can understand why for you it's, like, even more of a, whoa, what the hell, because it's your body that's going to have to go through yeah, all of these things. I literally, like, it's took me probably a year to recover from my surgery. If I'm being 100% honest, it was incredibly intense. And from the get-go, from finding out Connor's sperm was borderline, I can remember having conversations with Connor and having conversations with my mum saying I don't want IVF I don't want it I do not want it you're adamant I, I'm not having it no way am I having it no 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 I'm not going through this I'm not putting myself through this it's going to be all on me and I just don't think I can I've got I've got health anxiety the whole procedure the the needles the actual procedure you know the trust you know you've got to trust that these people are going to do what they're saying they're going to do like I've been failed so much in my life by the medical world that I sometimes find it hard to trust you know I'd be lying to say I still 
don't have reservations I do and I kind of thought that it a lot of times at the beginning of the year that Connor wasn't taking it as seriously as he needed to and that was making me feel quite on my own and this is this is the kind of conversation that we've had with the fertility counsellor who so the Centre for Life which is the place in Newcastle, it's Newcastle Fertility Clinic based at the Centre for Life, they recommended that we have fertility counselling. We've had a couple of sessions. Like Connor said, it's something different that he's gone through compared to me. And, you know, to also add to it, he doesn't take things as maybe intensely as I do. Yeah. Like, I, I worry about my health. I'm a lot more anxious than Connor. I've had a lot more to go through in the last few years than he has physically on my body. And it's just the thought of another thing. It's just quite heavy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think one thing for sure is you do overthink everything and you just think of things from every different angle. But going back to that appointment, we asked a lot of questions and we said, look, we need to have a little think about this. We weren't expecting you to present this to us today. And she said, thank you for being honest because a lot of couples just go, okay then, because they're frightened in case they get knocked off the list. So she said, what I'll do is I'll schedule an appointment with a consultant. She'll be able to help you with your questions because you do have endometriosis. It's probably better you speak to her. And mm. The nurse was brilliant and she got us an appointment for the following week. So we had an appointment with Dr. Stewart the mm -hmm. consultant and she was amazing she went through everything she said look you've got a really complex pelvis, pelvis. you've had you've got endo you've had the excision surgery this is brilliant you've you know you're in a good place right now to kind of go ahead we don't really want to prolong things we don't know how long endometriosis really takes to grow back and I think it's a smart choice, but it is up to you. And yeah. after that conversation... I think you felt a lot more at ease than you. I felt for the first time in this whole process, and this was the start of April, I felt the best I've ever felt about the IVF. So I said, let's go for it. Mm -hmm. So we said we would go for it at that point, And then they were like, right, we'll get the ball rolling. So the next step was for us, after we decided we'd like to go ahead, we were told that we would be sent some consent forms. And once we completed them we can proceed um, so that was April time and then we were kind of sat around waiting for a few months and we didn't get our consent forms till the 29th of June mm -hmm. so the very end so at the very have, end of June we did have to do quite a lot so of chasing. between between that time we were thinking well what what the hell's going on we're kind of left in the dark here so was, we did quite a bit of following up Ike phoned up Beth had phoned up because they kind of anticipated we'd have our procedure before the end of the year but yeah. then they said there's such a waiting list it's going to be next year so that, that, really that so yeah so beth was getting mm -hmm. stressed out thinking that we're not going to be starting until next year which is another year which gives the chance for the endometriosis to come back I'm she's older. another year older obviously the sooner you could do it the better so we just want a clarification and i understand it's hard for, the, for you know people to give answers um and it's just just frustrating um, so it was a lot of following up, but eventually we managed to get the consent form sent through. And that in itself was a bit of an ordeal. Um, you know, they do tell you to sort of be ready, try not to do it all in one go, because yeah, it's is, is, is a lot of, like, in my, when, they say, when, when they say it. consent forms, you think, oh, I think, okay, just click a few boxes, or a few pages, and that's it. No, not with not with this. It's um, <laughs> definitely not the case. So yeah, the legal I'll, documents. So yeah, mm. it's, it's a lot of heavy stuff because it is. It is there's a lot of layers to it that you don't really consider initially. The reason why this part is important is because apparently back in the day you would do the consent forms in clinic, and you would do the information sessions in clinic, but to make it faster and more streamlined, you get a link with all of the information videos and all of the consent forms on there in one go which is why it is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly overwhelming. Yeah. So you have a bunch of sections and modules that you have to go through, and there's like a 10, 15 minute video attached to each one. Um, so, you know, this is a long process and you have to kind of pay attention and watch through all of this because they, they ask you questions at the end of each one mm -hmm. to make sure you've been paying attention. So it's not something that you can just kind of whiz through quickly. Um, and a lot of the subject matter in it was very intense. It makes it very graphic. It shows what's going to be happening and where and risks. the risks involved. Things like Danger. what would you do if your partner passes away? What would you like to do with your your samples? So these are the questions that you never really think are going to be asked. And they, so it, 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 it tells you, yeah, but ICSI, uh, which is another form of... of uh, 
IVF of this complications that could come with that. And birth defects. Birth defects. Um, yeah. So a bit. It makes bit, it a bit too real and yeah, a bit so, too graphic. And I appreciate like they do need to tell you absolutely everything. But when you're already feeling fragile about it, mm -hmm. it's a lot. And I think it would be nice to know like maybe have a little bit of a breather in between it and be like oh but the positives are yeah <laughs> and like this is the the thing that can be positive and happen brilliantly but they, it feels very doom and gloom mm. and it's something that i wasn't prepared for and yeah it it really shines a light on how incredibly intense this process is yeah i think i think it's very easy to sometimes lose sight of why you're doing this um because there's a lot of yeah negativity um without seeing or being reminded of okay well what is the end goal for this which by the way the end goal isn't even guaranteed so that like that in itself is is something that plays on your mind like for me I, like Beth mentioned before I'm a lot better at like trying to it's my own way of dealing with things I try and I compartmentalize and just put it away which probably isn't the most healthy thing but it, that's how I protect myself and for me I try not to let, let those thoughts enter my mind and that can sometimes cause friction between uh, me about because then it can come across as if like like she said that I might not be taking it seriously or I might not care which isn't the case but um, so that is if you are going my advice for any if there's any other guys out there who are watching this and, and going through if you're similar to me that don't just assume that if you're feeling okay with, with, with it that your partner is as well you know I think as women a lot of the time we are better at articulating and expressing how we feel whereas men will just be in their head and maybe won't verbalize it but it's so important to verbalize it because this process like our fertility counselor said isn't just me it's 50 percent me it's 50 percent connor so he has to show up and he has to be verbal and he has to speak and he has to say what he's thinking because otherwise it can feel quite isolating and that's what he said in our last, last session didn't mm -hmm. he you don't want to feel like you're going through this on your own and connor mm -hmm. connor's like just behind or on a, in the sideline you have to be very present and together and he said like the the biggest thing we can do at this moment in time is make sure we're super tight and close mm -hmm. because you don't want that distance when you're going to go through something like this because it can break couples up mm -hmm. that's what they warned us they said you know i think uh, the fertility nurse said oh there's a three thirty three percent success rate and it can't break you up and i was like no 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 yeah. Whereas the consultant, she said that, you know, if you get a viable embryo, then that success rate goes up to, you know, yeah. over 50%. And it felt a little bit more hopeful, but then you, you do have to, you, you, you can't wear rose tinted glasses during this process. So, yeah, but eventually we, we you know, we managed to complete these um, consent forms. It took about three days. So, yeah, it did take a few days to get through. Like I had I said, a breakdown. Yeah, there was, there was a lot of, um, tension and a lot of I was uh, crying. <laughs> yeah it got, it got it got a bit yeah it got a bit um intense but when once you we've gotten through that stage now and we've the, the consent forms have been reviewed and now we are going in um next tuesday which will be tuesday the 25th of july um to go for the doctor's Sorry, not the doctor, the, the Centre for Life. Um, I always <laughs> get told, uh, the fertility clinic. The I just call it the doctors. If, if there's anything to do with health in your body, <laughs> I call it the doctors. Going in next Tuesday um, to discuss the next steps and choose a date for the beginning of treatment. So that's really exciting because it means that we, we're, we, we having, we're having, we're building momentum now. We have something that we can kind of focus on um, because for the longest time we've been sat kind of like waiting, well, when is this going to happen? Things are out of our control. It's just uh, dragged on and it's really made us put our life on hold because we're like, oh, can we book that or can we plan that or can we, um, you know, kind of commit to that because we're frightened in case we miss out on the treatment. I know a lot of you are going to ask about this. We are eligible in Newcastle for three rounds of IVF treatment and egg freezing, which we're very grateful for. And that's what we're going to go ahead and do. I think they call next week a scheduling appointment. Yep. I've, like I say, I've been really bad. I haven't recorded a huge amount. So going forward, I'm definitely going to record stuff so that you can see it in real time. I've got to be 100% honest. Things have been really incredibly intense. I've been very low not great i haven't wanted to pick the camera up because i am the kind of person when i show myself to youtube or instagram i want to be happy and positive and i want to show all the good things 
and as much as I am honest and open I just it's hard to physically want to show yourself when you're feeling so low and I think the sparkle has gone for me a little bit if I'm being honest I want to be honest I don't want to pretend I need to be honest because otherwise what's the point but like I don't associate the next few months of potential trauma it might be fine I hope it's fine but it might be traumatic too but I don't associate this process with having a baby I'm very detached for it I've been through the angry and bitter stage I've been through the really unkind to my body stage where I felt like I failed myself I feel like I have I'm not good enough I feel like I've been through the surgery for what reason you know I've looked after myself my whole life and this is how my body repays me and um, I've been really hard on myself and unkind to myself and just resented myself and resented everybody else there's been a lot of upset when I've seen people make pregnancy announcements it's not their fault it's not their fault but every month that goes by that we don't get pregnant and my period comes or we'll take a pregnancy test just to see and it's negative it's like just that reiteration of I'm not good enough like I can't do it like the most natural thing in the world and I can't even manage to figure that out that's the hard part because I am still so hopeful at this point that it'll just happen. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go through all of this, but I have to. I don't feel like I've got a choice. And I know I have got a choice. And also, if you're watching and you are in a position where you can't get free IVF, you're probably thinking you want to be lucky, but this is relative to me. And this is relative to everything that I've been through and how I feel. And every single person like I said has their own journey and their own story and their own situation so I can only share from my point of view and my point of view is I'm really scared and I don't know what's going to happen I don't know how this is going to pan out but I think we're just going to have to hope for the best yeah. I think a little bit more positive than that like yes we are definitely hoping for the best <laughs> But there's going to be a little... I know, but it's just been long. It has been very long. But, um, you know, it is scary, like everything you said, but it's also, like I said, like we just said earlier, there is a goal at the end of this. You know, there is going to be an outcome at the end of this and it will all be worth, like that's everyone says that we've seen, um, you know, they say when, when that baby does arrive, then it's all worth it. So I'm hoping that... It just feels really far away, It, it, it? does, but when I see that little miniature face of... <laughs> With big eyes like that, <laughs> looking up at me. I think that'll, yeah. uh, that'll cheer you up a bit, won't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So is that everything up to uh, now? I think so. We've done a lot there. But that's that's good. So I think that brings you up to speed. You know, I I will apologise if that was negative, but um, I I'm not. I promise so this, this that I'm going to be real it? and raw and yeah. honest, and I would much rather know that I've been a hundred percent true to myself than pretend that it's been sunshine and rainbows because it hasn't yeah. and it maybe isn't going to be but we just wanted to bring it up to speed as to where we are now we are I am really looking forward to next week and knowing what the plan of action is get a little bit more um handle on what the situation is going to look like moving forward and understand what the next few months are going to look like as well because it has been mentioned to us that I'm going to be put on the long protocol of course you can get the short protocol or the long protocol. The long protocol is five weeks of injections, so that's going to be fun. Or the short one is about two weeks, so um, they judge it off all of your health records and stuff like that and what they think is going to be best. So I'm doing everything that I can within my power. I've, like I mentioned, I've had acupuncture. I'm now under a naturopath to kind of try and figure everything out, get everything balanced. I've got huge imbalances in my gut because I have thyroid and endo it adds an extra layer of you know difficulty for getting pregnant because your thyroid plays a big part in that so I'm spending a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of energy trying to get myself into a perfect balanced if that even exists state of being so that when I go through this quite heavy process my body's going to be strong enough to 
embrace it and hopefully it'll be successful so we'll just we'll keep you posted and um, thank you so much for watching if you are also going through something like this then i'm sending you so much love and strength and support and always know that you can find me on instagram and you can message me i try to get back to everybody on there because you know i just want to share and support each other because sometimes it can feel lonely being a woman and going through these kind of things so if we can help each other then you know it just makes it a little bit easier so yeah we'll we'll keep you posted and hopefully have some good news at some point yes. you got anything to add to that well i think you've hit the nail on the head there we'll take you along for the rest of the journey okay thanks guys see you next time